Hello and welcome to Welch Lab Chemistry. Today we will be nitrating ethyl propyl perylene diamide to the corresponding mononitro derivative. For full synthetic details, please see the paper linked in the video description. For this reaction, you will need ethyl propyl perylene diamide, which we synthesized in a previous video, dried dichloromethane, and fuming nitric acid. Fuming nitric acid is highly corrosive and a strong oxidizing agent. This reaction must be done in a fume hood by an experienced chemist and the waste neutralized properly before disposal. Dry dichloromethane was used directly from a solvent purification system and was added to a 500 milliliter round bottom flask with a stir bar. In this reaction, dry solvents must be used since if there is any significant water in the reaction flask, it will separate out and form a two phase system where the nitric acid is dissolved in the water and the PDI is dissolved in the dichloromethane. If this happens, no reaction will occur. To this flask is added 6.4 grams of perylene diamide. I added the PDI slowly and without stirring so that you can really see the characteristic absorption and fluorescence of perylene diamides. A small amount of dichloromethane was used to wash the funnel and sides of the round bottom flask and then the mixture was stirred. Once the PDI is fully dissolved, the fuming nitric acid is added with a pipette. At this point, the PDI fluorescence is quenched by the nitrogen dioxide in solution and turns nearly black. This reaction is very rapid and is highly sensitive to the concentration of the reagents. As soon as the nitric acid is fully added, the reaction must be followed by thin layer chromatography to ensure that the reaction is stopped as soon as it is complete. After about 5 minutes, a TLC plate is run in dichloromethane. The left spot is ethyl purple PDI, the right spot is the reaction mixture, and the middle spot is both the starting material and the reaction mixture. From this TLC, we can see that our starting material is fully consumed and has led to the formation of a single product. Once a TLC has been taken that shows full consumption of the starting material, water is rapidly added to the reaction mixture. Once water is added, the reaction stops immediately since the reactants are now physically separated. To isolate the product, the reaction mixture is transferred to a separatory funnel, the stir bar removed, and the organic phase is washed with water twice to remove residual nitric acid. For the sake of time, repeat washings are not shown. The organic phase is then dried using brine and then magnesium sulfate to remove residual water. When the mixture is fully dry, some portion of the magnesium sulfate will remain suspended as small particles instead of clumping together. Here that is visible as a lightening of the solution color. The magnesium sulfate is then filtered over silica. We find that filtering magnesium sulfate over silica can help remove small impurities before the initial isolation, which leads to more pure crude products. The small amount of red remaining on the silica is likely the small impurities that were visible on the TLC plate. It is also worth noting that though the silica gel remains quite red, only a small amount of product is lost in this process. The solvent was then removed on the rotovap. The product was filtered using methanol to transfer. Methanol was also used to wash the round bottom flask, Buchner funnel, and product. Again, the red in solution represents only a small loss. It just looks dark due to the high absorption that is characteristic of PDI-based compounds. After drying in air overnight, I collected 6.7 grams of product, which corresponds to a 97% yield. This reaction will start to form the dinitrated product if it is allowed to run for too long, so our purity analysis will look specifically for that impurity. In the proton NMR spectrum, we can see that we have chloroform at 7.26 ppm and water at 1.5 ppm. Both these peaks are due to the solvent the NMR spectrum was taken in and are not impurities in the product itself. The rest of the aliphatic region shows only expected peaks, but the aromatic region is more difficult to interpret. The splitting pattern is not clearly resolved since there are seven non-equivalent protons in this region, six of which are doublets. If we look at the integrations of the aryl region compared to the NCH protons, we count approximately seven protons. This is evidence that we have either the mononitro PDI or a roughly equal mixture of non-nitrated and dinitrated PDI. 
To confirm that we have only mononitro PDI, we can compare the spectrum to that of the starting material on top and dinitrated PDI, which I accidentally made previously, on bottom. By comparing the peaks, we see that peaks at 8.45, characteristic of the starting material, are not present in the product, and that peaks at 8.3, characteristic of dinitrated PDI, are also not present in the product. Since we have a high yield of pure mononitro ethylpropyl perylene diamide, we can proceed to the next step, the catagon cyclization of nitro PDI. Thanks for watching, please subscribe, rate and comment, and I hope to see you next time for catagon cyclization.